Thank you so much, Kristen. Everyone, if you just give me a quick moment before I get this, while I pull up my screen to share it. Um, And I am hoping you all can see my screen, yes? Yeah, it's in view, Miranda. Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. So um, I appreciate you all being here for day two of the online mental health summit. And so I'm going to be um, talking about self-advocacy and collaboration. Um, as you, you were told, my name is Miranda Kegiwo Naiwu, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here with all of you today. Um, I just wanted to, for those of you who have um, the ability to view images, I did want to show you that um, this is the image that was, you know, on the, the I really like the imagery that we use at MHDD, um, the diversity of the images and, and kind of like the, you know, the whole comic um, vibe. So I just wanted to put that on here um, for a visual cue. And then I wanted to thank you if you're here, um, because I know that um, we're in the uh, digital, you know, we're in a world now where we're doing a lot of things virtually. And um, some of you, um, your camera might be off, but this is your life in the background. <laughs> this is, you've got, you know, things going on and you're multitasking um, and you're kind of trying to prevent catastrophe. So thank you for um, taking the time to be here despite whatever chaos might be going on in, in the background of your life. There are three primary objectives to the um, to today's presentation. Um, I'm hoping that um, I will achieve these objectives by being able to detail some ways that lived experience can inform work um, to help us to develop a strength-based approach to collaborations and to help you be able to identify next steps to self-advocacy and mental health. Be that um, if you're coming from the perspective of a professional, if you're coming from the perspective of um, a self-advocate, self um, or, you know, essentially if you wear both hats. I start all of my presentations out with what I call the five C's of accessibility that, you know, my five C's of accessibility. So I'm going to do the same with this one. And the first C is comfort. So I want all of you to be comfortable. Um, and so you have been given some information about how to use the captioning feature, um, how to use, um, you know, the, you know, and things of that nature, um, how to you know, share questions, et cetera. But other than that, be comfortable. So I had planned to get up, put some makeup on. I've got a really cute um, lip gloss that I bought recently and have my camera on. But today is not a good mental health day for that. So it's for me to be more comfortable. I'm in my hoodie and, you know, barefoot and I've got my camera off and I've got a stimming device right next to me. And that's what, um, and I have that. And that will be, you know, that's helping me to be more comfortable so that I can, you know, be present with you all. And then um, another, I'm so sorry. Um, my next C is for connect. And so um, it's best for us to connect with one another. So whether it's jotting down something that you have as a question, whether it's using the chat feature in the Q&A at the end, whether it's looking things up, sharing them with other people online, um, you know, sharing the wealth, you know, that's how being an active learner helps us to learn best. And so I just want to encourage you to be, to connect. Um, don't be a passive learner or you really will, or this will just be yet another webinar. And we all have a lot of those. Um, the next one I have is consider. Um, I want us to be considerate. Everyone here is different. We all have different experiences, different um, levels of knowledge, um, different triggers, different ways of communicating. Um, so please let's be considerate. If someone asks a question, maybe they use some terminology that's outdated, maybe you know, potentially stigmatizing and they're not aware. Let's use, you know, be considerate and be a community in the way that we you know, address that. Um, if someone is, you know, types to communicate and maybe is having a bit of a delay, let's be patient and give them time to get connected. Let's be, you know, considerate of the fact that every, everything is different. Everyone is different and we all have a right to be here. We're all um, trying to come from a place of growth. And my last um, um, two C's are for, um, 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 I'm so sorry. Whoa, I just had a brain fart, um, are, are for um, challenge and for commit. I want you to challenge yourself today. Um, a lot of you have a lot of learned and lived experiences, um, but I wanna challenge you to still take something away from today. Um, 
find something that is useful and beneficial that you can apply into your practice, into your life. I also wanna challenge you if you hear certain things that you don't necessarily agree with or you don't really know how you feel about that, but rather than just automatically dismissing it, I'd like to challenge you to um, you know, maybe look more into it, um, do a little research, figure things out, um, ask some questions, you know, don't just be closed-minded. Um, obviously you'll need to filter things out. Some things will, will be relevant for you and some will not. And my last C is for commit. Um, there unfortunately is, is not enough information about, um, you know, developmental disabilities and mental health, despite the fact that I think I'm preaching to the choir here that we all know that those things, you know, those are two areas where there is a, a lot of unmet need for youth or adults. Um, and, and it isn't something that benefits anyone for these things to be siloed. So um, in whatever capacity that you are in, I just wanna thank you for um, caring about the intersection of mental health and developmental disabilities. And I want you to commit to continuing to do wh whatever it is you're doing. Are you sharing your lived experiences? Are you, um, you know, implementing neurodiversity and inclusion into your practices? Are you writing? Are you a student or like what, you know, in some way you're helping and believe me, we need help because there's just not enough people doing this work. So thank you. And I want you to commit to continuing to do what it is that you do in your sphere of, of you know, maximum influence. Um, so I wanna give a disclaimer. I usually give a few disclaimers and I'm, but I've got an additional one that I'm gonna be giving today. So one is um, I'm just giving a disclaimer that I am a board member, an advisory board member of the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Center. Um, I'm, but I am doing this as part of my role, you know, as, you know, and I'm not getting any compensation. So um, I just thank you for being here today. Um, my compensation is being able to contribute to the work that we do, the shared work that we do. Um, I also want to give a disclaimer that um, if you are in need of um, image descriptions, so my presentations, I get really bored with presentations that, that have like 5 million um, bullet points, we can all read. And I don't really see the point of having a slide up there if you're just going to read verbatim what I can see. So I use images as kind of visual cues, um, but I have switched to a new software and it, it does really inaccurate image descriptions. So instead, um, myself and my part-time assistant are doing them by hand. So if you need those, um, I will be happy to send them to you afterward. Um, there is information about how to contact me um, near the end of the presentation. Um, another disclaimer, um, I just want to talk about in terms of content and trigger warnings. We're talking about self-advocacy, mental health lived experiences. I am going to be sharing about some things that might be triggering for some people. I am going to be talking about abuse. I am going to be talking about trauma. I am going to be talking about discrimination. I am going to be talking about exploitation. Um, so if these are things, you know, areas that are challenging for you, I just encourage you to, you know, utilize some resources for your own, you know, self-care. Um, and then lastly, I want to give a disclaimer that um, this presentation has been planned for some months, for some time, um, but I have changed some things up today and I have informed, um, you know, Ty and, and the others that, so in the, in, in in hopes of being truly authentic, since we're talking about mental health and we're talking about self-advocacy. Um, currently, um, I'm in the middle of, uh, you know, a growing mental health crisis now. Um, and so because of that, there are certain things that I've changed about the way this presentation was going to be shared. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit off script, um, just because I want to be, I want to be true to what it, what I'm dealing with right now, my reality. And so it might be, it's going to be a little unconventional, but I think it will still be um, beneficial for you. So before I go any further, I want to quickly talk about kind of some of the concepts or terms that we're using. So we are talking about, you know, self advocacy. So essentially, what is the self? Because um, often people use terms like consumer, stakeholders, constitu constituents, self-advocate, you know, as a code for those others, those people, you know, but we all have a self and ultimately all people should advocate for themselves and for others, you know, to be able to have a, a, some, any kind of quality of life. So I am a self-advocate in that I am a person with um, developmental disabilities. I, um, I'm autistic. I have ADHD. Um, 
um, gifted, um, some other things. <laughs> and, and I also have psychiatric disabilities. So I'm living, I'm a self advocate with, you know, who, you know, does live at the intersection of mental health and developmental disability. Um, but I'm also a professional. I'm also a parent of, you know, I'm also a professional, you know, with graduate education. I also, so I, li I, I live in both worlds. And so, and so do you. You might not, you know, have, you know, like ongoing or persistent mental health um, you know, struggles, like, you know, some of us do, or, or you might not have um, a formal diagnosis, but um, I think in life, we all have, you know, various different things that impact our mental health. Um, for the last, you know, 18 months or so, the pandemic has impacted a great deal of people's mental health as we see, um, you know, illness and death, as we've had lack of, of access to services, resources, loved ones, and have had to change a lot of things very abruptly and have not necessarily had, you um, being able to to replace those things or substitute them with things that were equivalent, and so um, all of us have a self, and we all need to know our boundaries and know how to push ourselves, but also know when to to push back. So I'm going to be talking about self advocacy um, because I'm talking from a community perspective in terms of people with lived experience being having developmental dis a developmental disability and mental health diagnosis or diagnoses. But I'm not ignorant of the fact that there is a self on the other side too. And so when we talk about advocating, you know, so basically it's um, you know speaking, maybe promoting or supporting or championing, it's you know being a voice of. Um, and so often when people, it, it's very interesting the term self advocate because most self advocates I know spend less time advocating for self and more time just as a general advocate because of what they have dealt with. In, within themselves, they want to kind of advocate more globally, more holistically for their community at large, for their, their neighborhood or for their, you know, organization or clinic or what have you. And so um, it's almost like the term is a bit limiting because it implies that most of our advocacy is for self and self is important. And when we are helping others, I think we do help ourselves by default. But um, I think I know we're using it here to, you know, essentially mean a short way of saying an individual with a developmental disability and mental health, um, you know, disability as well. And so, but advocating is something that everyone can do. And there is no right or wrong way to be an advocate. And there is no one way. Um, some people, uh, you know, an advocate, you know, if you have a two-year-old and they shake their head no, when you, um, you, when, they, when you offer them a particular food, that child's advocating for themselves. Um, so it doesn't require any particular type of cognitive ability. Um, it doesn't require, um, you know, having particular um, educational um, degrees or um, a particular age or anything. There's no, there are people who are engaged in legislative advocacy or um, research advocacy or what have you. There's different forms of advocacy, but um, they're just different. There's not one, they're not that are lesser, just like we have different types of flowers, different types of fruits. Um, they're not all the same. They don't all taste the same. They don't all have the same components and that's all right. They're, they're for different purposes. And then we want to talk about collaboration. And so, you know, collaborating is, you know, basically working together. And so there's different ways, you know, there's, you know, when you look up the different terms, like, you know, coalition, cooperative, collective, collaborative, and so on, they all mean different things. And, and some of them, there are, you know, you are, it is a group of people who are working for, together for one, with one shared goal, some, and one capacity. Others, we're looking at people who work in different ways, um, toward a common goal, but they all still have their, you know, individual or organizational autonomy. Um, however it works, it's basically, but there's still some type of connecting. There's still some type of holding hands, uniting, working together in some capacity, giving up something of yourself, you know, giving up your ability to do things your way um, to, for the, the benefit of, you know, of bringing forth another perspective to amplify your um, efforts. And then we are going to talk about things being strength based. And so a lot of times, a lot of things are deficit based when we're talking about developmental disabilities and we're talking about mental health, including the terminology that's often used. For example, I am, I am an autistic. The formal term in the United States for my diagnosis is autism spectrum disorder. 
I'm not disordered. My, I have a pervasive developmental disability that, you know, is part of my neurology that I was born with that impacts the way that I think, that I communicate, that I perceive things. And, but that's my natural, you know, that's my, um, you know, natural state of being. And it's not just, it's not disorder. It is a condition. It is a disability. And so I do like how in the UK they use autism spectrum condition. And that's what I prefer to use either autistic or autism or, or ASC. I don't use ASD. But um, the same thing when we look at a lot of the mental health diagnoses, the terminology that's used is um, can be stigmatizing. The treatment, um, when we're discussing people, someone suffering with X condition or what have you, we, we you know, find ourselves intrinsically using um, negative terms. Even earlier in this presentation, I talked about struggles or dealing with. And, you know, um, and for me, my, that's my life. Like there, it's to me, nothing about who I am, nothing about any of my identities, being a black person, being um, a first generation American child of immigrants, being an adoptive parent, being a disabled person, being a non-binary woman, all of these different um, aspects of who I am have positives and negatives and neutrals. So they, I do deal with them. I do some of them, there's some things that are very affirming, empowering about these things. Um, and there are certain things that are, you know, debilitating and challenging. Um, but a strength-based approach, which is one that differs from kind of the medical model that we usually see, it isn't coming with the, the idea of what's wrong, what needs to be fixed, how does this person deviate from the norm. But first, it looks at the areas of, you know, the, the, the pros. It looks at a building on the areas that are, you know, are, are, you know where there's, you know, advantage, where there's, you know, growth and strength. Um, and focusing on that first and leading with that before going into the negative. Okay, and then what's next? What is next? Well, we're gonna talk about that together. It varies. Um, how are you going to incorporate some of this work? Some of this, some of you are already doing, but hopefully what are some ways we can take things up a notch to use the you know, scripting that we can improve because we are always, you know, that's part of life. We're all lifelong learners. In a classroom of life, we're always continuously improving. How can we do better? What area can we strengthen or emphasize or, um, or add in if we're not doing in terms of our work with ensuring that there is adequate self-advocacy, um, you know, and that our, our collaborations, and, you know, are supportive of and welcoming to um, people, self-advocates. So I'm going to talk about some lived experience. And, um, you know, obviously when people do that, they're sharing different things about their, their lives. And so um, I want to, um, I, I'm going to share a few different things, but I'm going to start right here. And this is where I start going off script in that um, I think about the fact that, so we're talking about self-advocacy and collaborations and collaborations with a number of different ways, you know, whether it's, you know, volunteer, whether it's consultant position, whether it's, you know, formal and so um, several months back, um, you know, I met with Ty and some other members of the team about um, presenting, you know, um, for this summit and, um, and decided to, and we, you know, came up with objectives and kind of talked about the direction that we were going to go and, um, you know, I developed my slides and so forth. And um, in, re you know, since that period, there's been, I've been facing a lot of, you know, personal challenges in my mental health that have impacted me greatly. Um, and, um, you know, to, to be candid, so yesterday I had, um, you know, several different, you know, presentations and, you know, tasks that I need to do in meetings. And I also had an interview um, for a postdoc position that I'm really excited about. And I'm pretty sure I bombed it. I think I did terribly. Even though I had been previously prepared for it, even though I, um, I'm, I'm excited about it, I meet the criteria, but I'm just not right now, I'm struggling a great deal with anxiety, with depression, with other things. I'm, I'm just, so on top of the fact that, um, you know, as a person with a developmental disability, I have already inherent struggles, I do, with executive functioning, with communication, with, you know, um, certain self-regulation and a lot of other things. Some days are better than others. I can't really predict how it's going to be. It's almost like, I guess, maybe someone, if they have arthritis or allergies, 
um, my daughter has juvenile arthritis and one day she can wake up and she's totally fine. The next day she wakes up, her joints are like, you know, a flame and she's, it's very hard to move and she can't predict from day to day how it's going to be, you know, same thing with allergies. One day she's okay. The next day her allergies are just flaring up terribly. And some of it does have to do with the external world. Is there a lot of pollen and ragweed and so forth? But sometimes it's just that it just seems that the, the allergies themselves are just a little bit more sensitive. And I, I experienced that as an autistic person with my senses as well. Some days are more, you know, our, my senses are very, very hypersensitive and hyperacute. And some days they're, you know, a little more muted. And so um, I, I'm, when I woke up this morning, last night, you know, before I went to bed and then when I woke up this morning, I found myself almost in tears because I was like, I am not in any kind of a place to give this presentation. I am like in a, in a, in a really, I'm in a hole right now. I'm not, I'm not well, I'm not doing well. How the heck am I gonna do this? You know, so I'm thinking about the self-advocacy piece. Um, I promised, you know, I collaborated. I gave my word that I was going to do something. There are people who are registered who are expecting to hear information from me. I've made a commitment um, and that's a part of collaborating, but I'm, but my circumstances are, crap right now, what can I do? And so what I've decided to do, again, is make these changes. Um, I, you know, informed, you know, the partnering entity. I, I didn't, I opted not to back out and at the last minute, you know, an hour before and not present. I opted to go through with it, but I'm going through with it with changes because of my circumstances. And um, and that's how I've self-advocated sometimes with collaborations. The, the, um, the best way to advocate for oneself is to back away. Sometimes it just, you just can't do it. And that's, you know, and, and in that, I'm going to talk about when we talk about self-advocacy and collaboration, why it's important to have um, contingency plans and information so that if that is the route that you need to take, that you don't leave people, you know, in a bind that they still can kind of carry forth. Um, but, you know, but if, if you do continue, decide to continue, you can modify the way that you um, engage. And so talking about the story of my life, and so um, I, I have here like a storybook and some images, because when I think of story, you know, I just think of, you know, it just makes you think of, you know, childhood and fairy tale and narratives and all those things, you know, story can be a beautiful thing, but it can also be, you know, when we're talking about life, um, life looks lots of different ways. Life looks like, you know, living organisms, you know, <laughs> life looks like, you know, erythrocytes or, you know, things that are, you know, existing. Um, life looks like the lifespan, you know, so our lives from infancy through childhood, um, you know, adolescence, adulthood, and older adulthood. And hopefully most of us, we, we hope to have a, a long lifespan and that across our lives, we have different experiences and we grow and we learn. Um, but there are different things that happen throughout our lives that do impact us on, in the here and now. And so um, for me, you know, again, I'm gonna talk about, because I want this to be, I'm gonna use personal experience, but I am going to, you know, share some things that I think are more, you know, that are helpful for the collective community. Um, some of the life experiences you have can, you know, be absolutely catastrophic. Um, and problematic, and they uh, and you might continue going, you know, day day to day. But that doesn't mean that that you know there's still not an inferno in your life. And so thinking about myself and then my community as a whole, when we're thinking about lived experiences as a self advocate, <laughs> um, think about the narrative that we get in this world about who we are. So if you are a person with a disability, and in this case I'm, I'm talking about you know developmental disabilities and autism, um, the the world aside from the way the terms that are used for you, you know, that are stigmatizing, the world sends you a number of different messages in society that you're less than and that you're problematic and that, you know, and you all could have to advocate for yourself and, and expend energy where you shouldn't have to. Um, there, you know, you might, you're, you might be someone who's entitled by, um, you know, by federal law to a free appropriate public education and some accommodations. So having a quiet place to study um, outside the classroom and so, um, a school district might decide that our school that they want to put your 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 desk in the restroom literally over the toilet and that's your quiet place um, you might need some support or, or you know at school you might be having a difficult time and instead of figuring out ways to accommodate you and to to help you you to you know, to help de-escalate a situation we have school resource officers in a lot of um, in a lot of schools um, that, and there's a disproportionate number of youth of color who are dis disabled, who end up um, being restrained, being, um, you know, being, you know, harassed um, by these school resource officers and ending, and end up early in the 
criminal justice system as a result um, of using this, you know, kind of basically um, ad this advanced, you know, excessive manner of, of addressing disability. We have filicide, which happens all the time, where either people abuse and or kill, well, in the case of filicide, um, kill their child or their loved one, so much so that there is an annual day of mourning for people with disabilities who have been murdered by their caregivers, whether we're talking about older adults who have been uh, abused by, you know, maybe if they have adult children or if they have, you know, a caretaker, or whether we're talking about disabled children who have been abused and murdered or people who have been abused by their partners. Um, or if we're talking about abuse that we face from authority figures because people, there are, you could be in a congregate care setting um, and there could be, you know, there are restraints or things that can happen that could, could um, of impact and, and possibly even end your life. That happens, it's a, it's a reality. This is, you know, and in this case, um, you know, so it's just very interesting in terms of when you think about these things um, and we're talking about self-advocacy um, before, you know, the the work that it takes that it requires just to get people to, um, to be able to respect you as a, a believe, believe that you need even just the basic civil and human rights that anyone else believes that you're a human being, or that you're a person. It's very, it, sometimes it's just hard to get people to even see that. And so one example that I'd like to give is this is, this is several years old, but there was a, um, 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 a public service announcement that was created by Autism Speaks several years ago, talking about autism. And this image that I have on the screen right now is that of um, you know, kind of the original puzzle piece. Like, you know, a lot of people with developmental disabilities are not, you know, with autism in particular, um, are not comfortable with the use of puzzles. Um, although it's been kind of um, reframed as, oh, puzzles are interesting and unique. They all have different pieces and we need them all, you know, but the original thought were something that's puzzling and missing and doesn't fit into the world. And that's not exactly a comforting way to be described. You know, there is a reason why um, my, the, the, the diagnosis my son has is now called intellectual disability as opposed to mental retardation, which is what it was called when I was young, because that term in itself is not a neutral term. It's a very loaded and stigmatizing term. So I wanna play this quick clip of a video. It's called I Am Autism. And this is how autism was described and depicted not only to parents, but to the general community at large. And so again, when we're talking about self-advocacy, how these are the people we're supposed to be entrusting. These are professionals, these are organizations, quote unquote, working on our behalf, our side, our people. And this is how they might be describing or viewing us. I am autism. I'm visible in your children, but if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you live, and guess what? I live there too. I hover around all of you. I know no color barrier, no religion, no morality, no currency. I speak your language fluently, and with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another language. I work very quickly. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And if you are happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. Your money will fall into my hands and I will bankrupt you for my own self-gain. I don't sleep, so I make sure you don't either. I will make it virtually impossible for your family to easily attend a temple, a birthday party, a public park, without a struggle, without embarrassment, without pain. You have no cure for me. Your scientists don't have the resources and I relish their desperation. Your neighbors are happier to pretend that I don't exist, of course, until it's their child. I am autism. I have no interest in right or wrong. I derive great pleasure out of your loneliness. I will fight to take away your hope. I will plot to rob you of your children and your dreams. I will make sure that every day you wake up, you will cry, wondering who will take care of my child after I die. And the truth is, I am still winning. And you are scared. And you should be. I am autism. You ignored me. That was a mistake. Sobering, huh? All right, so hold on, let me get back to my actual presentation. Where are you? Sorry, y'all. There you go. Okay, so when the, my, um, my, my sons, um, my older sons who were not autistic, 
saw this this video years ago. Um, and they're, you know, my boys are, you know, typical, you know, like, you know, macho, want to, you know, play macho, want to act like, okay, mommy, don't kiss me in front of people, you know, when you drop me off, you know, type of thing. Like they were getting to that age. And I saw them both fighting tears um, at the, the prospect of the fact that this is how their siblings and their mother that they love, this is how people are viewed. So, um, you know, if you think about, this is developmental disability, but with mental health, if you think about all of the different terms, oh, this is psycho, oh, the, the weather's so bipolar, oh, this is crazy. Think about how stigmatizing most of the terms are that, are, that you know, describe us. And then, so think about why, so just, just to exist, the energy that it takes, I'm sorry, just to exist in this world, um, when you are um, dealing with all of these, these things, um, when you're, the world is telling you everything about the way that you think and move and, and process things is wrong and you need to second guess yourself at all times. Um, when you, and then other things, again, lived experience. So taking this to, you know, like talking about this generally, but also personally, um, thinking about gender discrimination. Um, so are you, um, do you get messages that, you know, you're a sex symbol or that you aren't as authoritative as someone else or that you aren't as informed as someone else? Do you do the same work or more work and get paid less um, because of your gender or maybe because of other marginalizations that you have? Do, have you been taught, like I was, that you have to, quote, work twice as hard to get half of what others have? Um, are you in circumstances where, you um, the, the way that you communicate, you know, people misinterpret it, uh, misperceive it. And so now they became, they become belligerent or hostile um, and it, it shuts you down. You know, what are you facing? We all have difficulties, we all have challenges, we all have struggles. I don't know yours and you don't know mine. Um, you know, and sometimes in life, you know, I'm not gonna, for the interest of time, I'm not gonna show this video right now, but um, many of you might've seen it, it's Carly's Cafe. And it's Carly Fleischman, who is a, um, um, an uh, individual who has um, mental health and developmental disability diagnoses. Um, and Carly made this video with um, her twin sister and her father several years ago. Carly is a, a non-speaking um, individual who types to communicate. And um, despite the fact that her sister and her father, you know, she had a close relationship with them, they still didn't understand a lot of things about her. So in this illustration, she was just showing a visit to a, a, a coffee shop, a cafe, and how her father did not understand what she wanted to order, ordered the wrong thing for her, the sounds in the background and the noises, and just kind of like the whole sense of disregard and, 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 and um, frustration that, you know, she had that most people are just sitting idly by, enjoying their afternoon, not even recognizing. So how can, you've got these lived experiences. So you, you have whatever, you were born, whoever you were born, wherever you were born, as whatever identities that you are. You can't change them. So, you know, I am autistic, I am black, I am all of these different things about me. Um, and so some of this, some of these things I can try to improve, you know, about myself. I can try to find ways and strategies that work with how I am. Some things I can't change about the way society is or the, the ableism that, I, that exists or other um, you know, circumstances. And so some of them, I just have to try to, to you know, recognize or acknowledge what I'm facing, what, it, what is the, the present, and then do my part to try to change um, those things. And so um, I want to, to look at a couple of qualities that self-advocates often have um, so I know that, you know, so people, there often is this, and it's not intentional, but it's almost this paternalistic um, kind of relationship between, um, you know, the, like the professional or the provider and the self-advocate, you know, almost like, you know, like, for example, I don't, you know, I love and respect my children, but they're children. And so there's a, there's a difference in our relationship. They have, um, they they have a sense of self. They have, um, they have the right to say yes or no, but there's certain knowledge that they don't have. Um, and so I might overrule certain thoughts or decisions as a result of that. And we see that with mental health um, and developmental disability in terms of the partnerships. But I think that a lot of professionals are um, discounting the resiliency that um, self-advocates have. Like just what it takes, like to show the Carly video, just what it takes to sit through 30 minutes in a cafe that you all can't understand. Just what it takes to get up in the morning, just what it takes to, takes to deal, the amount of scripts, when someone turns their head, smiles at me and says, how are you? The amount of um, programming and effort that it's taking for me to turn my head, try to make eye contact appropriately, 
use the right tone of voice and answer with the appropriate script. It's not instinctive for us. And by anything, all a lot of the things that are done um, almost, you know, um, you know, now, you know, like without even thinking subconsciously by the rest, by many people are things that we have to consciously and manually do. So the resilience that people have, even when it looks like they're facing, you know, and the growth, because we are essentially people who are living in a world where um, we're plopped in a world where no one speaks our language at all. And we have to learn from a very young age without help, how to speak and understand your language how to communicate in your language so that you can understand us. Um, and that's, and this is, and, and we're doing this alone. We're not doing this with the help of someone who speaks our language. And if you think for any of you who are bilingual or trilingual or multilingual in this room, you know, I think about my family growing up in a multilingual household. Um, my, my parents, you know, my mother, for example, um, her mother was from Cabo Verde, her father was from Nigeria. And so she was fortunate in that if she was in a, you know, mommy speaks Portuguese, daddy speaks English, and you're in this and that in Yoruba. And so you have someone, if you're confused about the language, if you're moving around and you're living in a, a place where they're, they're not speaking your language, you can turn to your parent and they can kind of translate for you. Um, but who has that? If you, you know, when, again, when typically, um, you know, mental health and developmental disability go hand in hand, they exist, you know, together. It's very few people who have one or the other. Um, just, and so, and then, but maybe the people in our lives don't have an, a great understanding of our neurology, you know, and therefore, you know, can't really help us grow. We have to do it on our own. We have to, you know, kind of, you know, we have to fail so that we can learn how to, um, to, to succeed, you know, you know, kind of like the saying, about learning 999 ways not to learn a light, how not to make a light bulb, just to learn the one way to make one. And so um, unfortunately, it's very difficult and painful to have to fall um, and, and bang one's head to learn. You know, ideally in the world, we, we like to scaffold people's learning and experiences. There's a reason why, for example, um, when children are learning to walk, before they learn to walk, we learn to, you know, kind of scoot or roll or crawl, and then eventually steps and then walking. There's a reason why with bikes, we have tricycles, then training wheels before we go to um, something else, we, because we want to have, there's a, we want to have protection, we want to have buffer for the times that we do fall, um, but uh, that, there often isn't something like that for self-advocates. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how um, to try to be a little empathetic and understanding of people's experiences and how they, and what they might be bringing into the table. I mean, bringing to the table um, when you partner with them, and then and why it's beneficial. So often, um, a self advocate. So you've got somebody in front of you, and you see them in, in clinic, or you see them at group, or you see them, however you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So again, aside from the fact that their, their life might be, and you know, you basically they might be assaulted every moment of the day by the senses that are around them, by the unwritten spoken rules of society, by um, their own fears or anxiety because of circumstances that they're dealing with, the, by the regular stresses that all people have. They also, we are also more prone to, um, you know, having experiences, having experienced violence, having experienced abuse or trauma. Um, and it isn't, it isn't obvious. People don't see that some of the treatments and interventions themselves are abusive and problematic and take away our agency. They don't understand that, you know, that provider who seems so nice, that, that the caretaker who comes to do, you know, some, you know, activities of daily living at home, you don't know if they're, you know, making rude comments, if they're inappropriately touching someone when no one's looking. Um, and then our, is it our partners or our parents, are people abusing us verbally or physically or sexually or other ways, but we, do we really have Will people really believe us when we speak up about it? Or do we really feel like we have options, you know, to leave this person who we might depend on for some help or support? So what, what is the person dealing with either in their present life or maybe in their youth? Maybe they're not in an abusive situation now, but maybe they grew up being bullied or maybe they grew up um, being harmed or, you know, or what have you, and those things still impact you. Um, myself, I had parent, my parents loved me and still love me. My parents are amazing. My mother is an undiagnosed autistic woman. My father is very neurotypical. Um, and I grew up, um, and my parents and my siblings didn't understand about why I couldn't have this food touch this food or why I didn't like the way this tag fell or these socks. They didn't understand why or why I needed to make these noises or always go through this door, or always do things this way or play certain music or videos or movies over and over. They didn't understand why but they, they knew that it helped me and they allowed me to do these things. They didn't understand the why, but the what was okay. So in the outer world, I might've been a weirdo and everybody, I couldn't get what I needed, but at home, 
I could. They didn't know why, but they felt like, okay, this means something to her. This helps her out. This makes her feel calm. Cool, go for it. But despite having a loving family, despite being having people that I knew cared for me and accepted me as I was, I still had a lot of mental health challenges. Um, unbeknownst to my parents, um, uh, uh, we had someone who lived with us when I was young who, um, who molested me. Um, and I carried that quietly. I didn't want to tell them. As a child, I knew that my parents had their own stresses and burdens with bills and life. And I knew that they would blame themselves for not being able to protect me, even though it was not their fault at all. And so I, um, people are very perceptive, you know, and people think that we don't understand what's going on. People use terms around us, talk about someone has the mental age of a five-year-old or someone's severe autistic or low functioning, or they talk about um, people saying, oh, he's having a manic episode as if we can't understand or, or what's being said or what's being inferred about us. People understand a lot more than you think, regardless of their cognitive ability or their communication abilities. And so I, these things that happened to me starting at age four, um, um, led to, um, you know, contributed to feelings of looking around and seeing that nobody had hair like mine or nose like mine or no one could ever pronounce my name or people thought my food was weird that I brought to school or they didn't understand the holidays that were different than my family celebrated. I started being suicidal as young as, you know, sixth, seventh grade. I had a suicide journal. I literally, you know, mapped out all of the different ways that I could, could end my life and the pros and cons of them. And, you know, and I would have, the only reason that I did not carry through is because the ones that were acceptable to me were what they, I couldn't access them. So I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to have um, major pain. So I didn't want to do anything that was going to cause pain. I didn't want to do anything that my parents were going to come and find a body that was very, very like damaged. So like if you know if you slit your wrist or you're hanging yourself or you drown yourself, having to come and, and find you that way. So I wanted to do something that was relatively painless and that um, and that I would not my corpse would not look um, triggering. And so the only thing that I could think of is sleeping pills. You know, take go somewhere, take some sleeping pills, kill yourself. But I'm a kid don't have uh, transportation, don't have a way to get around, How, who's gonna sell sleeping pills to me? And then where am I gonna go and for enough hours for it to take effect before someone would wake me up and take me to the hospital and intervene? So it's only practicality is why I, I stayed alive, not because I wanted to. Then just the life that you live in. My parents were are immigrants from um, who came to America um, in hopes of a better life and they were planning to go back to their home country. It never really happened. And so we grew up, um, and um, moved around a lot in the Midwest. And then um, we moved later to Texas. And some of the, the area that we lived in that we could afford to live in was an area that had a lot of you know, um, unrest and crime. And so um, in looking for some pictures of my childhood home online, I couldn't find really any because um, I could, every time I Googled the area, I just found all these articles about murder and death and destruction and things that were going on. <laughs> and so, that, you know, and then there was the fact that, you know, we, you know, when you have, you know, again, when you're looking at um, mental health and developmental disability um, holistically, um, you know, a lot of people um, find themselves exploited, manipulated, and taken advantage of. Maybe it's in the workplace because we don't understand the social cues and things of that nature. So maybe we take on too much work or do other people's work, or, you know, maybe it's in the classroom. Maybe we do too much because we're, we're so eager to be accepted. Maybe we um, allow people too long of a leash, you know, to do too much to us, um, to be, to make those jokes that are not funny or, or to do whatever it is, because we just, we can't really, we're, again, we're always being told that we're overreacting. We're over the top. We're imagining things or that's not a big deal. So someone can slowly begin grooming you for abuse, you know, or, you know, or some other type of, you know, um, manipulation and gradually doing so, and you may not realize it until you're too late. And that's the circumstance that I found myself in with my quote unquote first love, who had been a, a, a friend, a dear friend for a long time, who was someone who I thought understood me, and very gradually went from, you know, became a codependent, verbally abusive, and eventually physically abusive relationship. And um, and you're not going to tell people that, you know, you're not, you, this, it's, it's something that's shameful. You're frightened of it. And then you're also hoping that it will change. Um, so you're just caught up into that cycle. And so you find yourself in those circumstances. Um, myself, um, you know, and you want to, but again, when you're a self-advocate and you're collaborating, you, you have a, a quote unquote reputation. You find yourself in a situation where you want to be the success story because everybody thinks that autistic people can't work or they can't do this or can't do it. So you want to get that to those degrees or you want to have a job so you can show, or you want to live independently. Or people think, oh, you have a mental health 
condition, you're not stable, you're not fit to raise children, or you're not fit to do this. So you want to say, no, yes, I can. I can be everything and then some. I can be the ambassador for my, you know, for my whole being. I'm not going to be a quote unquote statistic. I'm going to show that I can do something. So you camouflage and you mask and you put us on, you know, you, you do whatever it needs you need to do to survive and you neglect yourself. And so some of, and, and, but it has a, it takes a toll. It takes a toll on your mental health. And in my case, it, it took a toll on, you know, my physical health as well. I engaged in self-harm quite a bit, um, scratching myself, pinching myself, trichotillomania, pulling out my hair at the roots, um, pulling out my eyelashes and, and eyebrows and so forth. And, and, you know, just a lot of things that people might do. Um, and then there's the world that tells you, that disregards you for no reason. Um, I wrote a poem after um, the death of George Floyd in which I, um, or I basically pondered whether I'm a monster for bringing children into this world knowing how, because of the skin color that they have, and in their case also the disabilities they have, that they're a lesser being. That was it irresponsible for me to to, to, perpetu to continue perpetuating this harm because I know the world looks at, you know, my teenage son and sees a thug. They don't see a kind young man who opens doors and who's super sweet and nice and loves to cook. Um, we are hashtags. We are forgettable. We are examples. Um, and that can take away in, uh, bits and pieces of you. But that also can make for some really, really painful, awful, but useful information that can be used to help others to um, transform and inform services, research, practice, so that it actually impacts the people that it's supposed to impact. So that it actually uh, has, it makes, um, has a practical, um, makes a practical difference in the lives of, of those of us who need it, not just what other people think we need, but we, what we need. So, um, I want to, so I, I want to share a few experiences that I've had that where I've been encouraged um, or I, to, to collaborate um, and to share my experiences. And so in some of those ways have been through my writing to kind of share the things that I've been through in my speaking, but those aren't the only things, you know, so um, this is an image of uh, the disability. Sometimes, you know, allowing people to just grieve or be angry or about the way things are, um, about the injustices, because it shouldn't be this way. But um, I've also, for the sake of my babies, and these are these. This is my Fab Five. I've got another bone star that's not in this picture, but these are my. These are. This is the reason why I wake up every morning. This is the reason why I breathe. These five amazing, you know, just black disabled children, um, who I want to make world, the world a better place for, and because of them, I I I can't accept the status quo. I can't and I won't. And so because of them, um, I started to. Um, I initially started in being involved in things to kind of give my perspective, um, things like a focus group or a survey or what have you. And it just has grown from there. And it's really giving me um, a, you know, a platform to have a strong voice. Um, one example that I'd like to give is um, some of the collaborative work that I have done with the, um, um, with the um, NIH um, HIV Clinical Trials Network. So they have networks that do research for prevention, treatment, and so forth of HIV. Um, and every last one of some, if you, if you think back, because I know that developmental disabilities were, you know, and the neurodiversity movement, we're quite behind other movements. When we think about other movements, we think about, you know, like the anti-imperialism, you know, the colonial powers, 1960, for example, is when Nigeria obtained its independence. You know, I think 1956 was Ghana. So we looked through all that eight years when all of the different, um, you know, countries shook free from the colonial powers. When we look at the civil rights movement, um, and what it, you know, was uh, accomplishing around that time, you know, that time frame. Um, we look at other, you know, movements. Um, we, you know, I think that when you look at a lot of movements, social movements, they start out almost like this fringe thing, almost like a fight. You know, I, I have been mentored by a lot of the um, AIDS um, Act Up um, activists. Those luminaries are amazing. And basically they were ignored. Professionals didn't want to hear what they had to say. They, they asked to be included. They were ignored. They wrote letters. They, you know, tried to provide feedback. Nobody wanted to hear what, what they had to say. Who are you? This person, yeah, I've got a degree and I'm this renowned PI and you're just some peon. You're just some um, queer, um, HIV positive, nothing. You know, I don't want to hear what you have to say. And so people were like, okay, fine. Well, you're going to listen whether you like it or not. And, you know, similar to how people have used civil disobedience, whether it was, you know, it's in, you know, um, you know, at, on buses, like the bus boycott or marching across, you know, or, 
um, or various other things that they've done. People staged die-ins and they chained themselves to buildings and they bum rushed meetings and they sent in public comment after public comment and they demanded to be heard. They weren't given a, a place at the table. So as Shirley Chisholm said, they brought a folding chair. And so eventually it became, um, they, it was realized that instead of ignoring and fighting the resources we're using and energy we're using to ignore and fight these people, let's hear what they have to say. And when people actually stopped and listened, they realized, wow, some of this stuff makes sense. It actually is like useful. I didn't know this. I didn't think this. They didn't realize because they weren't asking the people who it really impacts that the dosing of some of their medication was so toxic that it was killing people more than, um, than, than their diagnosis was, or that the terminology that was used was hurtful, or that the service, you know, the, the, there were so many things that were, that have been transformed. The medicine that we see today that right now we're all beneficiaries of what the um, HIV and AIDS activists did because they brought us fast track trials and they brought, brought us compassionate trials and salvage medicine trials and all. And they brought us a lot of the different things that we see in terms of um, informed consent and a lot of the you know biomedical ethics. We, the very vaccine that we're utilizing for COVID-19 has been built on over a decade of monoclonal antibody research for HIV treatment and cure that hasn't manifested in, in, in terms of that accomplishment, but it's been, it gave us a huge leg up to where we didn't have to start from scratch when we began trying to search for a way to address the coronavirus. We've all benefited from that. And it started with a forced marriage. It started with, you're going to effing listen to me. You know, kind of like, again, like I said, the two-year-old who shakes their head no. Um, you know, you may think that they're having a tantrum, but why are they? Is there a real reason? Is there something, you may not like the delivery, but what do they have to say? Have you given them a mic to really listen? Because once you do, you often can find that instead of starting out like a forced marriage, which is how they started out with the AIDS clinical trials groups and a lot of those major groups, it started out with fine, we'll listen, we don't want to, but we will. And then it started being, okay, we want to. And then it started being, it grow, grew more and more to where it went from this unequal partnership to a very, very impressive um, model for community engagement. Every single, so the oldest and largest HIV clinical trial network in the world and several of the others that have come after it, every single one of them, the criteria that are, that are now required for them to exist, to get funding, to operate, every single site must have an, a functioning, autonomous, and operating community advisory board led by the people. Um, they make their own determinations, their own decisions. They must be given funding to survive, to and they are allowed, to, and they they must have at least one individual who is at a leadership in a leadership role at the network level um, per site. So basically, you know, you have research protocols, and you've got all of your PIs and your statisticians in there, and you also have your community representative who has an equal vote, equal information, equal decision from the ground up. From the conception of a study to the you know recruitment to all the way through not just okay let's run a focus group let's just ask some people what they think um and give them a gift card and send them on their way no if it's a three-year study seven-year study whatever they're involved um the entire way through um as an equal they don't have the they might not have the learned expertise so they may not be the one telling you about pharmacokinetics you know kinetics i'm sorry i can't even talk but they have their lived expertise and it's valued and it's seen as important and so an analogy um, that I like to give for that is I think about, so all of these, I'm sorry. So every single site must have a functioning cab. They must provide folks um, funding for it. They must provide staff support for it. The, the um, resources that are, they must provide training. Um, things such as, you know, um, network uh, meetings or symposia that you send your scientists to, you also send the community to, so they can be informed and they can share their perspective. Um, this is required. Um, there is a quality, there's a survey that's conducted by the community representatives annually. And if you score low, if you're not um, adequately providing um, the services, resources, support, and, you know, that are necessary for the community, you can literally lose your funding. Not literally, you do. Sites will and have been cut, slashed. You lose your whole seven-figure budget, everything, because you weren't, you know, because you didn't value the voices and the, the impact of the community. And so th th this, is, this is one of many ways that people can be involved. I think about another um, option. There is a, um, right now um, there is, um, and some of you are here from AUCD. I am part of the um, Autistic Researcher um, Review Board that is through the um, ARP study. And so this is a kind of a, a group that it's, it's like, a, it's really an inaugural group of people who are, all of us are 
autistic, and we're involved in, in research in some capacity. Some people are graduate students, some people are early career um, you know, scientists, some people are a seasoned career one. Whatever the case is, we bring the lived experience of being both autistic and research. So we wear both hats and we kind of see, you know, and so when we're reviewing, um, you know, we, we can look very quickly at, you know, something, you know, if you think about most peer reviewed data, if you were to research autism or a lot of things, look at how stigmatizing the wording is. Look at how few um, informants there are. Like there's a lot of study, I mean, how, I'm sorry, how few self-advocates there are as opposed to informants. Often there are people are asking the parent or the teacher or the whomever to observe us and state what, what, what is what. They're not asking us, even if we have the ability to communicate for ourselves. And so um, I have this image of Steven Universe on the screen because I love Steven Universe. I love that show. Um, and in it, it, basically it's a story of Steven who is part human, part Jim. Um, and him navigating between his human world, his human life, and his gem world. And that's kind of like the way it is for a lot of us living in a world where we might have a developmental and or a mental health disability, but we live in a world that's, you know, designed for, you know, people who are abled. And so as a result, we have to learn how to navigate, how to um, balance, you know, their way, their rules, while not suppressing ourselves. And we make mistakes along the way, but the differences that we bring you know, the crystal gems all have different strengths and different skills. So they, you know, all of these people on the screen, some have, you know, strengths that the other ones do not have. Together, it's a cohesive team, just like you would think about a band. Someone plays the bass, someone sings, someone plays piano. You don't all do one thing. And so um, a similar example um, can be found in, um, I love anime. And so I love um, the Dragon Ball um, and Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Super. I love that very much. And it is basically a story of, you know, the Z fighters are all people who have different strengths, different abilities. Um, some are, are, you know, really great um, tacticians. Some are, um, you know, really physically strong. Some can come up with, you know, really creative uh, moves. And so basically they are, um, it's, a, it's a show where it's, you know, essentially there are people who have come and they've really, you know, they've, they've started out in one way, maybe adversarial, maybe ignorant, maybe violent or frustrated. But over time, you know, you know, a lot of them have evolved into kind of like, and and some of them have used those experiences or that um, past anger or you know that to help others, um, to help the people maybe that they were trying to destroy. And so um, there's a video that I want to show um, quickly, and it's about um, it's featuring these two individuals that you're looking at. <clears throat> And so if you don't know anything about Dragon Ball, you don't need to know anything for it to make sense to you. Um, the character on the left is Goku, and Goku is an um, alien who came to the Earth and was raised here um, and didn't realize that he was an alien. He has, he's always tried to protect the Earth, and he's, um, he's very he's strong, and he's, you know, but he's also kind and naive. He makes mistakes. He lives his life kind of vulnerably but openly. Whereas the, you know, he came from um, kind of a lower class background, whereas the, the character on the right, Vegeta, is from a high class, a royal family. He's, a, he's literally a prince. Um, he was reared very differently. And yet it's confusing to him how, despite his intelligence, despite his, his noble blood and his ability, this person, Goku, seems to still keep surpassing him and doing so much. He doesn't understand. Um, but ultimately, and it's been like the bane of his existence and they're kind of like adversaries. But ultimately he comes to see the value in um, Goku's way of doing things. And I feel like a lot of providers, there could be a similar um, evolution for you in terms of self-advocates and collaborating with them. Oh, it's difficult. Oh, they didn't show up. Oh, they're, they're just complaining about this. Oh, this took too long. Oh, so much more efficient if it was just us. Uh, whatever, whatever, you know, complaints or, or that you might secretly harbor. Um, maybe, you know, I, I would like to explain this because Vegeta came to see how the person that got on his nerves the most and was the most annoying that he thought, you know, how this, this person um, truly um, what, you know, was a fighter, you know, who's worth emulating. Grammarly is such a lifesaver for all students. Honestly, if you don't have it, where have you been? It's basic. Amazing. How do you do it, Kakalot? <laughs> You've always been like this, ever since the day I first met you. Always ready to meet the next challenge, even if it's bigger than you are. So we meet at last. 
We have been expecting you, Kakarot. We were beginning to think you wouldn't show. Hopefully now things will get more interesting around here. Uh, how can this be happening? I am a super elite! The prince of all Saiyans! It was the same on Namek. You had improved so much that it made Raccoon look like he was standing still. Your power had increased so dramatically since our battle on Earth that I thought you had done it. I thought that you had become a Super Saiyan. It tore me apart. How could a low-class soldier accomplish so easily what I, I had struggled my whole life to achieve? Transformed. After living every moment of every day for the singular purpose of surpassing you, I finally became a Super Saiyan myself. The Prince had reclaimed his throne and fulfilled his destiny. But no matter how strong I became, your power still exceeded mine. At first I thought it was your loved ones. That it was your instinct to protect them that spurred you on and pushed you beyond your limits. But then I found myself with a family of my own, and my power didn't increase at all. I used to fight for the sheer pleasure of it, for the thrill of the hunt. Oh, I had the strength unmeasurable. I spared no one. And yet, you showed mercy to everyone. Even your fiercest enemies. Even me. Yet you never fought to kill, nor for revenge. Only to test your limits, and to push yourself beyond them. To become the strongest you could possibly be. How can a Saiyan fight like that, and at the same time be so gentle that he wouldn't hurt a fly? Oh, it makes me angry just thinking about it. But perhaps it is my anger that has made me blind to the truth for so long. I see it now. This day has made it all too clear. You're better than me, Kakarot. You are the best. And so I'm going to stop the share sound and go back to the slides because we're nearly done. And I want to have some time for talking. But ultimately, so when I think about this, we, um, and it's, you know, and I say this with all due respect. Um, you can um, have, you know, multiple degrees and you definitely learn a lot with, you know, in, in higher education, I'm, you know, completing my doctorate myself now, you know, so I understand that you can have professional experience that is very, very, very insightful and, and useful. You can be involved in a community, you can learn and care and know a lot, but you will never, unless it's, you will never know what it's like to live and walk in those, that person's shoes. I'm an adoptive parent. I love my children with every ounce of my being, but I'm not adopted myself. And I will never, ever know what it's like to be adopted. Raising a child, raising an adopted child is not the same as being an adopted child. And so as much as I care and I do the best that I can with my knowledge, I benefit and gain from um, the, the, the wisdom and the experiences of um, adult adoptees. And I've used their, uh, you know, their advice and, you know, kind of, and again, everything doesn't apply. You filter certain things out, but sometimes you hear things that are painful that you don't like or, or that make you feel convicted or judged or like crap. And sometimes you hear things that make you feel affirmed, but, every, but all, most of the learning that, I, you know, that I've gained has made me a better parent to my children. It doesn't mean again, that there's perfection. Goku has made a number of mistakes um, that have cost <laughs> his loved ones dearly, um, his naivete or sometimes his desire to um, or even sometimes he's been selfish, even though he's a kind person, you know, there's a, he at one point hired a hitman to kind of, you know, try to kill him so he could try to see if he could elude the person, like, you know, evade the person. Um, and that was, that's pretty careless and pretty reckless and, and, you know, traumatizing and terrifying for your loved ones. He didn't mean anything by it. And so when working with self-advocates, sometimes we 
blurt out things that aren't appropriate, or we don't know, we say things that or you know, that might offend somebody or do things a certain way, we may not mean harm, you know, but doesn't mean harm is not done. It isn't all sunshine and butterflies and roses working with us. Vegeta and, and Goku certainly had a tumultuous relationship, but ultimately Vegeta knows that by working together, they are together, the two of them can, are un-effing stoppable. And the, the earth is safe with the two of them, with the Prince of All Saiyans and then with um, Goku, um, you know, working together. Whoa, that went too fast. And so similarly, we, this, um, I'm gonna pull this back up in a minute. I'm gonna, I wanna go to Q&A. We are stronger when we talk about a strength-based approach. If we set things up in a particular way, if we make things accessible, if we make, encourage people to use terminology and processes to where um, people know that they're, they're welcome, um, then we're setting things up so that people can be active collaborators or we empowering them, giving the information that they have, letting them know they can contribute in the way that works for them. Maybe it's not going to be in the exact same way that you do. And it shouldn't be. That's your full-time job that you get paid for. That's not theirs. So their contribution is important, but it's going to look different. You know, certainly, you know, when I think about being an adoptive parent, um, I had one, you know, there was an attorney that we had to pay hire for our children, an ad litem attorney. Um, and then we had like an immigration attorney and then we had our family law attorney. I certainly did not want to pay the ad litem attorney um, any more than I needed to when I was paying enough already. They, are, they were paid to, you know, speak on behalf of the children and investigate and interview teachers and medical professionals and neighbors and so forth and the child individually and come up with a report. And that was their job. And the immigration person had their job. Everyone's billing their different amount of hours. Some of them put in a, a lot less work, but that work was so valuable that I paid them way more money than the people who were putting in more hours of work. It's not about, but, but again, we're not talking about value in terms of what's better, what's worth, worse. It might be about what, how much is it expending? You know, that person, that self-advocate that comes to be on a 15 minute panel, you might've tanked their day, their, their week. They might be triggered and depressed for an entire week because they've dug into those painful experiences that they've been through and they vomited them up for people, but they do that and we do that day after day after day, because we want things better, to be better for the, the youth coming behind us. And we want professionals to improve their practices, improve their um, diagnostic tools, improve their services. We want them to better understand and, and have treatments and have studies and, um, and you know, that center us better and really help, um, you know, help um, improve our lives. And so we take one for the team. We take on that pain, just like, again, as a, as a world, we've been, you know, social distancing and uh, isolating and people have been giving up a lot, sacrificing a lot for the greater good, for that community immunity um, so that we can get past this. It's not without sacrifice, it's not without challenge, but it has, it's worthwhile. And so similarly, you, you are too. You are worth it as a professional. You are worth improving your practice. You deserve to have the best practice you can be and make the best impact on um, the people that you can and your um, clients are worth it, and you, the self-advocate, you are worth it. And so um, I really want to make sure that we have the other 18 minutes for like discussion and question, but I did want to put my contact information up here because as I mentioned to you all, if you need um, the image descriptions, I want to make sure to send them to you or if you want um, any other information um, as an accommodation because I know I have a lot of um, um, challenges with executive functioning, organization, and memory. I do use a, per, I have a part-time assistant. And um, so this is who you'd reach out to, to help, to, you know, to, to, reach, to contact me. And this is how you can find me on social media, Twitter. I'm at Morena KGO. My website is Morena KGO. And um, I'd love now to use the remainder of our time um, to hear from and talk with you all. And thank you so much for, um, for being part of this, this presentation and just being here. Thank you, Berna Kay. That was um, excellent. And thank you for your shared and lived experience. I'm going to help you navigate the chat right now. So as questions come up, I'll offer them to you as well. Awesome. Ready? <laughs> Not yet. Okay, that's fine. And also, I want to share with you all, if you don't have questions, but you just want to share or comment, or like I saw some people have shared, there's some great resources, like some resources for resiliency and um, for like growth. And like, you know, so if you have resources also, which I'm sorry, actually, I'm going to put some in the chat as well, a couple um, for you all um, too, that might be of interest to someone. Um, but, um, but if you have anything that would be 
you know, that you could, that you think would be beneficial with regard to how you have, um, you know, successfully, um, you know, combined um, self-advocacy and collaboration in your life or in your work, or you have seen bad ways <laughs> that has been done, um, then let us know. Because I've certainly been in experiences where I felt othered. And, um, you know, there's one community advisory board that I was a part of where um, the, the staff were CCing each other back and forth about something. And then they, they replied all, and one of them, you know, and we saw how they talk about us. We're not there. One of them was like, well, I don't know if we can get them to review that document because, you know, we don't have per diem to give them for, you know, or whatever, whatever, and they're not, they may not want to do it. And I'm thinking, so you think that this little raggedy $25 and this, this cold Jason's Deli sandwich that we're here for this? Because if you must know, it costs me more to park than it does in, in the gas and in finding a babysitter for my kids than, than it does than what you're giving me. You know, like what you're giving me does not, you know, does not compensate for what I'm, you know, digging into to, you know, so it just was like, to me, I was like, wow. So you don't think that we're going to read a document and send an email of some opinions unless you pay us? So this is all transactional? But yes. You know what I mean? And so I had to write back and then tell them, I said, do you understand, do you know that such and such as husband is going through cancer right now? You don't know that, do you? That every time when Kylie comes to these meetings, she's leaving her, her husband alone at home. Um, do you know that such and such is unemployed right now and is, is, is from couch to couch? Do you know that such and such is, you know, struggling with their sobriety, but yet still comes to these meetings, even though it's a trigger because of where they're located, it's kind of near where, where their dealer is? I wrote back. I said, you can keep your freaking, um, you know, um, per diem. If you don't think that you send it out to those of us and those of us who can answer will and those who can't won't. But I said, but what you, your, your per diem and your, you know, is not even uh, close to what we're contributing for, for your, you all to have a successful, you know, we, we know, I mean, when you look at your real budget and what you're really getting for running this, you know, for operations, for travel, for, um, you know, mail, for um, part-time compensation of salaries, what the little you're giving us is crap. You probably pay the janitor more than you're paying for the community um, kind of contribution. So there are times that you can do it in a way that's hurtful and that can, you know, and again, I'm sure she obviously didn't mean to CC all us, but if you're not talking about folks like that in the first place, then guess what? You won't have an issue if you accidentally CC all. So, but again, there could also be positive, wonderful stories too. That's, that's just, that's, you know, that's only one. Um, I, you know, and again, and this can be done in lots of ways. It can be ongoing or it can be one time. I think about, I recently reached out to an organization that I get a newsletter from them and there were some things that they worded in a stigmatizing manner. And so I just wrote to them and I just kind of said, so when they wrote back and they um, thanked me for my contribution and they actually sent it, um, a a new version of the newsletter out to everyone. And I was just pointing it out for the future, but they actually took it upon themselves to make the change and then send it out and you know um, take accountability in front of everyone. That was amazing. It made me feel so heard. Um, you know, and, and so, I mean, you have no idea um, the ways that you can, you know, when I am somewhere, when I'm in a meeting and um, a white person talks about the importance of racial equity, it just makes my heart sing because I don't want to have to be the one to talk about race all the time. I'm black. You know, that's everybody back everybody thinking when they see me or when someone is talking about the importance of, you know, accessibility or captions or this or that or asking questions or when somebody brings those things up and I don't have to be the one or that person doesn't have to be the one or you when you're, you know, sharing the perspectives of those who can't necessarily be in the room. And that's something that I try to do, like I mentioned with the um, uh, adoptive parents. I try to do that with a lot of my, I, there's a lot of, autistic people who are non-speaking, who are amazing, brilliant, but sometimes logistically their, in, their participation in some of these settings can be challenging. And so these are people that I respect and I learn from. And so I will take the, their perspectives and with my privilege, because I am a person who is able to speak, I am sometimes non-speaking, but I am primarily able to speak. I take the perspectives that they have, that they didn't get a, um, an audience to share. And I share it where I am because someone needs to hear it. And if I've got the privilege to be able to share it, then, um, then let me share it, <laughs> you know? So um, again, I'm sorry, I keep talking. Let me, let me stop and leave the, the, the next 12 minutes for anything that you all want to share with the, great, with the group. And again, I just really appreciate and thank you all for, um, for everything. There are several comments um, just saying that people enjoyed it and thinking it, thanking you for your honesty and for being real. Um, there are no specific questions that I see. Okay, People are sharing fine. resources. Mm -hmm. Lots of thank awesome. yous. Mm -hmm. 
And so I, I encourage you, um, everyone here, and thank you. I'm starting to see the comments now. I'm going to read through the chat. Thank you so much for sharing resources and for your kind words and things that you all have shared. Um, and I'm actually going to screenshot it and come back and look at it. Um, thank you for the person who talks about um, a person, I would say, who happens to have autism. So I want to actually address that. I see um, Gina, and I hope it's okay that I mentioned your name. Um, I believe it was Gina. Um, uh, oh gosh, there's so much stuff here. Um, really great comments. All right, so Gina mentioned, I always say a person who happens to have autism. I use that uh, with anything and I wonder what your thoughts are. So there's a lot of different perspectives. So there are some people who use person first language, you know, like for example, Alicia mentioned it. Like, so, and I think that person first language can be very powerful and impactful in a lot of ways. And, you know, when person first language first came, you know, was first emerged, it was very radical. It was like, you know, um, basically like, no, I'm not an epileptic. I'm a person with epilepsy. See my humanity, see who I am. And one community that uses person first language in a very, very um, powerful way to me is the HIV community. They say, I am a person living with HIV. I'm not HIV positive. I'm not a person with AIDS. I'm not infected with AIDS. I'm not infected with HIV. Those are stigmatizing terms. So they emphasize the fact that this might have been a condition that once killed people, but with the advances that we have today, people are living long lives. Um, people are having HIV positive, um, you know, people living with HIV are having children. Sorry, I, I still sometimes slip up myself. Having children that, don't, that are HIV negative and they're living their full lives. And so they're emphasizing, but in some conditions, people use identity first language. The deaf community often uses deaf and hard, hard of hearing. Um, the autistic community, again, everybody has their own preference. Like for example, just like how I use pronouns, both she and they. So I'm fine if someone says she is a, a good person, her presentation was nice, or um, they talk too fast, you know, but I really like what they have to say. You know, um, I'm, I'm glad to be in a presentation with them. Both of those things are fine, those work for me. And so for some people, person first language is better for them to say I'm a person with autism, you know, or, you know, that's fine. But some people prefer to say I'm an autistic person. Um, and um, some people, when they say person with autism, they're just saying that I'm a person. Hey, I'm Jan, I'm Joe, or whatever. And this is one part of my identity. But some people use it to distance themselves from the condition. And that's why there are other people who tend to um, use identity first language because they don't want to separate themselves from the condition. Like no one says, I, I didn't come to, when, when my bio was being read, nobody said, Marina K is a person with blackness. Marina K is a person with parentness. Marina K is a person with, you know, um, graduate degreeness. No, you didn't say that. She's a black person. She's a parent. She's a this, she's a that. You're a, a counselor. You're not a person with counseling experience or with counseling job. You know what I mean? A person with womanness. You know, so um, a person should be honored for whatever they use. Like I have a good friend who considers herself a person with autism and I don't refer to her as an autistic person, but that's disrespectful. Just like I wouldn't disrespect her pronouns. I call her by what she has chosen to be called. But when I talk about the community at large, I usually use on the spectrum, which is kind of in between or autistic person. I very seldom will say with, you know, with autism, because autism isn't with me. Like, I'm not going to leave it behind. Like, I might drop my purse. Oh, I'm coming over here with some food. You know, autism is always with me. It's not sometimes with me. Um, and then I see some people talking about, I have my diagnosis, but I'm not them and they are not me. And that is true, um, too. And so I really like these remarks that you all are making, but it's just something that I want to share with people. So I think about some of the, an analogy that I'd like to give is about, before I ever knew I was autistic, I always knew that I was Black. I'm Black, you know, and um, and people are born whatever color they're born. And we we are all inheriting the sins of our forefathers, even if we didn't do that stuff. You know what I mean? If you, even if, you know, it sucks, but we, we come into a world where that's the dynamics that we have to face. And it doesn't mean that we have to live with the big scarlet leveler over our head or, or be constantly apologizing. Instead, we should all just take an action to, make, to try to make things equitable and to make things better. Some people have more privilege than others. And some people have more privilege in certain settings. Don't be ashamed of it. Use that freaking privilege. As I mentioned, I do it. I use my speaking privilege to share the perspectives of my non-speaking colleagues. Um, I have people who have used their privilege, you know, as professionals to bring in self-advocates so that we can speak. So they, you know, people book them. They have, you know, it's kind of like a bait switch. You know, they book them thinking they're going to give the same old, same old, but instead they're sharing these views about neurodiversity or inclusion or what have you. And so, um, I really feel like when it comes to um, certain diagnoses, like I would life be easier if I was, you know, assigned male at birth or if I was, you know, cis or straight or white. Yeah, it probably would. Doesn't mean you wouldn't have challenges because a person can be a, a heterosexual, cisgender, um, you know, white male who's upper class, but you're disabled. And that's a marginalization right there. It doesn't matter if you have privilege in a lot of areas, you're a subhuman as far as the world is concerned. You are regularly going to be discriminated against despite your so-called privileges because the marginalization that you have 
uh, is one that the world um, is not very kind to. So we all have privileges again, and, and um, we all have marginalizations. But for me, when people say I have autism or my son may have autism, but autism does not have him, that sends to me a negative connotation. That's like saying, oh, you're so, you know, even though you're black, you're so smart. I mean, that's like implying that I shouldn't be smart because I'm black. Or when I think about growing up in the South, I would have guys sometimes tell me, oh, you're so pretty for a dark skinned girl. Oh, wow, you've got long hair for a dark skinned girl. I'm thinking, oh, so I'm supposed to not be able to grow hair because I'm not biracial? Like, it's like the, you know, or when someone says, wow, you're so articulate. So I shouldn't be. So it's almost like when people say my diagnosis you know, are not me, they aren't you. They're just a fair part of you. But they also aren't, you know, a lot of parts of our story, again, there's neutral, there's good and there's bad, are still parts of our story. So it's just about the way that we describe things. Um, I really like here, um, thank you, um, the person who talked about the ADA having to print it out um, and having to know their civil rights. It's just really, you know, I just, I don't know, I just really love what you all are sharing. And then there's some resources that Jen and some other people, Jen Castro has shared about um, um, various, there's various different links that I encourage you all to take a look at if you can download. Um, there's, um, I'm really, really happy to see Gina, she's sharing about um, having um, been through foster care and kind of like the needing the importance of having those adults um, who speak up on behalf of what's going on and the children with IDD, with ID and um, foster care who are some of the children who are so often ignored. Um, and so often, and, and the, if we look at the statistics of disabled people of color, um, you know, and, you know, or even we're talking about in whatever intellectual and developmental disability we're talking about, if it's ADHD, if it's, you know, autism, whatever, um, and mental health, when you look at if, if that person happens to be, have spent any time in the foster care system, they're, the, they're gonna, the statistics are gonna be a lot more abysmal. And so I just really appreciate, you know, what you all are sharing. The adversity in, in high disparity populations, my child doesn't ask me any person we call that over a person with autism. Um, Cheryl, um, I guess what I'd say to that is um, there are people who will say, I'm not African-American, I'm black. I ain't from Africa. My grandma is, you know, is, you know, fourth Indian because there's a negative connotation with being seen as African. He is an Aspie, but he's also, uh, he also has autism because an Aspie is simply, Asperger's is part of the former criteria of autism spectrum condition. It was pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, autistic disorder, and Asperger's syndrome. Now they all are all one, when again called Asperger's, um, I'm sorry, autism spectrum disorder, or again, condition. But it's, it's kind of like a person can't say, I'm not black, I'm Ethiopian. I'm not black, I'm um, Haitian. Yes, you are. That's the type of black, that's your ethnic group, that you're still black, you're this, you're that. You are a black person who's Haitian, as opposed to a black person who's a New Yorker or you're a black person who's, you know, Nigerian or whatever. Um, you are, you know, people have differences. And so, but there's a lot of internalized ableism. You know, a lot of people, if, you're, uh, if you cringe when people say certain things, if people see a school shooting and they think autism, if they think, if they see, you know, someone being, you know, then, then sometimes people will feel like, you know, I don't want to be called that. You know, there's certain terms, you know, during the um, Hurricane Katrina situation, um, I live in, in Houston, and we had a lot of people who came to from New Orleans to Houston to preside, and the news was originally calling them all refugees. Now, a refugee is simply a person that takes refuge from one place to another, but a lot of people were, you know, felt like, you know, typically the term refugee is used in America to describe people who are fleeing from one country to another. You know, kind of like what you know, a lot of what's going on today. Uh, and actually, my children are um, former refugees that were, you know, that are adopted and uh, unaccompanied refugee minors. And so they were like, "Hey, um, I want to be called an evacuee. I don't want to be called a refugee. It sounds like you're trying to say we're not Americans. It sounds like you're trying to say this or that." So the terminology sometimes, you know, um, that the way you say certain things, you know, can really be helpful for people. And when you don't know, you ask. You know, and I think that. We need to give people grace and space. Um, there was a recent article in the Today Show, and I only have, I think, one or two minutes, so I'll try to be quick. They talked about the war between autism parents and autistic adults, and it really saddened me because, first of all, a person can be both an autistic parent and an, you know, and an, um, and an autism parent and an autistic adult. But also, there's not a war. We all want the same thing. We want things. We want to be done differently. We want a better, more equitable world. Um, but if, if someone, if what somebody wants is going to smash and destroy our human rights, then there's no middle ground. You can't compromise with someone who doesn't think that you deserve to exist. You know, now in terms of how you exist, 
we might have differences. And that's where we work together as a community, as a team. But basically, you know, self-advocates, parents, all of us, we all want the same thing. We want better. And um, we just need to listen to each other and work together to make better happen. And it's at the, the half hour, so I will stop talking now. Thank you for those of you who are still here for remaining. Thank you for being part of, of, of all of this. Um, I just really thank you for your, your time and your attention and um, your dedication to this work. Thank you so much, Marina Kay, and thank you everybody for being here. The next session starts in about one minute, so if you need a break or if you're going somewhere different or just coming in, the next session will be starting soon.